the beginning design process. So if you are trying to solve an issue or solve that problem, you do need to use a CAD program in order to design these type of models, either that or using something like a blender or mesh mixer that shapes STL files or shapes polygon meshes. Um, so have you guys already used CAD programs and which ones do you prefer? Tinkercad, uh, one, two, three, D. One, two, three, design, yeah. yeah. The kids usually use Tinkercad, or they use one, two, three, D. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. You know, they have yeah. one of the desk colors, but it's mostly elementary and middle school kids, so we don't, they tend to use Tinkercad and one, two, three, D. I think okay, three. Yeah, so I do like Tinkercad. It's easy, simple, and kind of, you know, there's not much to it that you have to worry about most of the time. It's not, you know, tedious or anything. So some CAD programs can be a little tedious, like your selection and different things like that. Um, and there can be a lot of parts to one object, and it can be a little confusing at times. I prefer Fusion 360. It's uh, kind of what I've grew into from working with Inventor Autodesk before. And it's a really nice program. It's less uh, hindrance on your computer because it's more of a little bit of a cloud-based system and they use to run certain renderings and different things like that. So I do like Fusion 360, so if you guys are looking for a different one to maybe use, that is free for three years if you have an educator license and you can just sign up. Yeah, um, we have an educator license for that. We use it, we have the, the 3D printer that uses uh, Form Labs. Form Labs. Form Labs. Okay, so Form Labs is actually a different type of 3D printer and it's a resin printer. Yeah, we have a well. Very accurate. So the Lulz bot is probably closest to what you guys have. Yeah, the Lulz bot is very similar to the type of printer that we're actually utilizing. It's the same form of a rep wrap, which means it's kind of like a open source firmware idea. Um, yeah. Lulz bot kind of made it generic and then that's all they really did. Um, so it uses pretty much the same type of firmware and same kind of local that it does prior so yeah so since we kind of know what's going on with the design and everything I won't be uh, too long on that so we can go ahead and move on to Cura and we'll change our settings for our printers right now so we'll change them for the A5s and this will set for profile specific so if you were to log in on a different account with the same computer that you changed the settings with it will be different next time um, so it's only for your profile so if you were to log in again you'd have all your settings changed but we have an available um, JPEG within the Cura folder that you installed it from from the little USB drives. And that is always there for you to kind of look at. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. And if you want to step through me, step through Cura with me, then that would be it. All right. So here in the middle of the surface, you're going to see this big blue box. And that's what it actually designates as our as our uh, build area and what we can actually use. So let me reselect another printer real quick. Okay. So now we're going to kind of go through each of the steps here. And here on the left hand side, we'll talk about a little bit of what each of these are. You guys are pretty familiar with 3D printing, so it should be pretty smooth. So here on layer height, we're going to have the utmost determinant of quality. So this decides how nice or how coarse your object will be. So 0 0.1 is going to be the highest quality that these printers can print out. It's going to be about the lowest quality you're probably going to want to print in order to see your models well. So I'm going to leave that value at 0 0.2 just for a medium quality print. Shell thickness is determines the thickness of the outside walls of your model. The top and bottom and the outside walls, the perimeter, is treated differently when 3D printing. So here for the shell thickness, we want to change it to 0 0.8 millimeters, and that needs to be a multiple of our nozzle size. So that's yellow right now because our nozzle size is 0.5, and it's a little unhappy about it. But each layer that passes, it's going to lay down 0.4 millimeters, and so if you want it to pass twice to make the wall, it'll be 0 0.8. Three times would be 1.2, and so on. Next, we have retraction, and we do want to enable retraction. That's because if you don't have that enabled, often what happens is you have a little bit of runoff from your, from your nozzle due to the pressure buildup of plastic, and this helps to pull the plastic back a little bit and then it, whenever it gets to its final moving point. 
So the bottom and top thickness, we're also going to change that to 0 0.8. I do like the same thickness walls all the way around my model, and that's what that's going to be used for. So you can have this at different values. It's not necessarily a multiple of your nozzle size because it's going to go back and forth in more of a zigzag pattern when it's printing the bottom and top of the model. So next we're going to have fill density. I'm going to change this value to 5%, and that is the de determinant of durability or how strong it will be on the inside. So whenever you put a model into a 3D environment or 3D slicer, what this program is, it'll actually basically hollow it out and then place infill inside of it in order to support the walls and the bottom and top. So for this printer, we're gonna leave it at 50 millimeters per second for our print speed, and that's right at the fastest that this printer goes while still maintaining its chance of quality and work and getting those overhangs that you may have on a printed model. So, you are welcome to lower this values. I like sometimes lowering it to 25 or 35 to increase quality that it actually provides or increase the overhang. And then if you do move it up to 60 millimeters, you may start to notice that it can knock your build off or it can have gapping in the layers. So next we're gonna print our plastic at 220 degrees. So the plastic we sent you guys is PLA and it is also a, has a composite within it that makes it extra flexible. So due to this flexibility, we need to burn it at a little bit of a higher temperature in order to liquefy it. So there are multiple different types of PLA that keep coming out more and more often, and one in particular does have a little bit extra, so it does need more heat. Um, so that may change varying upon which tool you're using. So sometimes colors of PLA can adjust what temperature it should be at, as well as the type or of the PLA does determine printing temperature often. So that is the value you may have to change if swapping between different types of filament. Next, we're gonna have bed temperature. I'm gonna change that to zero because the A5s do not have a heated bed. Five by six by four inch build area doesn't necessarily need it. Most things shouldn't warp too heavy if the bed is leveled correct. So here on support type, we're gonna change that to everywhere. You guys are welcome to manipulate that as you want. Um, I like to change it to everywhere just for the students that may be using it so that they understand that if they do need something with supports or something that is trying to be printed there, that Cura will generate it and they shouldn't have to worry too heavy about that. Next, we're going to have platform adhesion type. And platform adhesion type is exactly as it says. It helps keep that model onto the build area. Uh, we don't like to use raft because it uses too much plastic and it takes up too much room. BRIM is usually the largest platform adhesion we use. Um, we're going to leave that at none for right now because the model we load in shouldn't need that. Next, we're going to have the diameter of the filament, and that's going to be 1.75. And that's just based upon which PLA you may have purchased. There is some three millimeter diameters out there. You you bigger nozzle for that size. Though. All right, and finally, we're going to change this nozzle size to 0 0.4. At this value up here, it's going to turn from yellow to white, meaning it's happy about that and that it can actually produce that result. So one thing I hadn't really covered was the flow compensation percentage. And if you change this value by 10%, it's going to squirt out 10% extra or 10% less filament, and that's just what that works for. So we have any quick questions about what we just went over? Are we good? No. no. You'll probably feel comfortable with it, right? Comfortable enough. Cool. All right, so what I went ahead and did is I came up here to machine and machine settings. And this is so that we can change the build area of our current printer. So if I click on machine settings, it's gonna pull up an area in where I can adjust the width, depth, height. And then we can also change the value of heated bed. The maximum width, is going to be 125 millimeters. The maximum depth is going to be 150. And the height is going to be 100 millimeters or right around four inches. Finally, you can unclick on the heated bed. And then this should be completely set up for a printer. You guys have multiple printers. It might help to change the machine name here in the bottom right hand. Name it NWA 3D, A5, or yellow handed printer, whichever one you would like. So even though this is Mendel, we automatically keep it 
the correct settings, I have to go in there and do that? Yes, so it usually increases the size of the build area to 200, 200 by 150, and that build area is a little too large for our printers, and we just have to change those values. Um, that's just because Mendel is a the umbrella term for the operating system that the printer has. Okay. Then we'll click OK, and then we're entirely set up for everything. You said to him to send this to us because I can't remember what they said. I'm sorry? Did you say you were ready to send it to us? Because I can't remember all the settings you just went through. So. Oh, yeah, certainly. So here in your little USB that came with each of the printers, so there's a small SD card that came with the printers and that has a USB adapter. Yeah, we've got a plug in. Inside of the Cura folder, there's actually a JPEG that shows all of those settings for you. I've got you. Okay. Yeah. So that JPEG has everything that we just went over. So this is basically like our base settings that we like to use, and that also provides it for you. So if you need a student to install it or something, they can always look at that on that SD card. Awesome. So now the process would just be to talk a little bit about loading a file in. So here in the top left-hand corner, I would just have to click on the load and the and then in the SD card that we have, we do provide STL files. We get STL files once we finish creating something from our CAD program. We're going to import them and export them as G code for the printer. So I'm going to double click on the six sided dice and it's going to plop it into the build area. And if I right click on this object, it allows me to center on a platform, delete or multiply. And then we can also do all commands, pretty similar in the same sense. So if the model is here on the side like it is, and you, if it's gray, that means that it is not printable where it currently is. So you would have to move it before it would be printed. So I'm gonna center it on platform just by right clicking and left click on the model. You should see that there's three small buttons here in the bottom left should pop up. I mean to rotate, scale, or mirror the object as I please. So here on rotate, it pulls up three axes that allows us to rotate in whichever axis we would like a lay flat command which helps to try and find a flat side and lay it down. I don't find that this always works but it is something that you could utilize. It's also a reset button in case you have it in some position that you go back from. Scaling is going to be proportional unless you unclick uniform scale here. Button. So we can always change this value and increase it in order to double the size of our object or to reduce it in half depending on what you're trying to print. So sometimes models may end up very small from student files or they may be very large from student files and this is a good way to scale those and make it a little bit more manageable. There's a reset function in here as well and then a two max function or blowing this cube up until it is the full size of the build area will support. Next we're gonna have mirror and mirror flips it over an axis 180 degrees and that's all it's going to. So the other thing I want to show you is over here in the top right hand corner is view mode. And if we click on view mode and navigate to layers, show us the slicing commands it used for the view. So it actually shows us all of the layers and the, sl the slices that it's created and how the printer is going to move through those. So here in this model, we know that the red is going to be the outside perimeter or outside wall. The green is the inside wall. The yellow is going to be support or infill. And then the light blue, like this skirt on the outside, is going to be your support material that helps to overhang or otherwise. And so one thing I do like to check whenever I put models in is that I do have it on the build area and I have by going all the way down to the first layer. The model is going to be printed you want to make sure that it is on there because I have noticed a lot of models do end up with maybe a small point and it isn't enough surface area for it to print. So once we confirm that that is happy and we're good with that, then we can go ahead and save it to the SD card. So we can either click on toolpath to SD or since I'm picky about where it's saved, I like to say file, save G. And then I'll load it back into my SD card, click save, and I'm going to overwrite my previous. 
So that is all of Cura, and you guys probably feel pretty familiar with that. Do you have any questions about kind of the interface or how it works? No. Okay, sounds good. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Most of the problems are kids when they do when they do 3D printing that I've seen has to do with the the piece that touches the the, the little area doesn't stick right. They didn't put enough surface area down there for it to stick right. Yeah. I find that's often true. Um, I've had some recent models that a teacher sent me and the biggest issue was that they just weren't sitting on the build area really. Um, they had created the model in Tinkercad and then what had happened is the model, the bottom layer wasn't like flush with each other so they never aligned anything. Our area to be basically trying to print a millimeter above the build and it's just not. Yeah. Awesome. So. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about basically what we do afterwards. So we eject the USB, take that SD card, and that SD card is what is actually going to be inserted in the printer. So I know some accept USBs, and this one sets the SD card itself in order to get inside of the printer. So it's directly underneath a button here. Oh, I'm going to show that to you. Cameras were fast, and it's going to be right underneath here. All right, do we need to turn the printer's been on for a while? Do we need to turn it off before we do this? Nope, printer should be fine if it's on. You can actually just refresh the area to show up the SD card. Um, it can't adjust it in any way, it shouldn't hurt it at all. These can basically stay on forever as long as you would like them to. Um, they usually, as long as they're not heated, there's not going to be any troubleshooting issues that we have to go over based on that. Uh, if it is heated and it's not printing, it does actually create a problem with a clog. Could happen just from the baking of the filament inside in the office. All right, so that would be step three. So step two is Kira, step one's design. It's transfer, and step four would be just click to print. Check out the printer real quick. Let me plug mine in. Click on the button once, that's how you select extra steps there. It's going to pull up the rest of your menus. The first screen is the status screen, and then if I click on it one more time, we have setup, controls, SD. It might say no SD card or print from SD. If it doesn't say either, you can click refresh SD card at the bottom and it should show up for you. And we have the I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing you there. Do you want us to, we, have, we didn't go through the machine setup thing on ours the way you were doing, so we're watching you. Do you want us to insert our SD card? Sure, so there's actually test prints on the SD card that have the exact same settings we just used. All right, so we don't, we don't need to go in and set up the, the, uh, the size of the print. No, you don't. That should already be true for the test prints G code. So that's a folder inside of your SD card that you can use to test it out here at the very end of the troubleshooting. All right, hold on. We're going to insert the SD card now. Then. Certainly. You have to refresh probably. Okay, so we select print from SD. Yep, so all you would have to do is print from SD, and then you would go to Test prints. Test prints, and then you would select one of those. So first, we're going to kind of talk over the shipping steps because these have gone through shipping, and we want to make sure that everything is okay on them. So most of the time, they can print out of the box. It's very true that they can. Um, one thing that we find, though, is that the bed tends to be a little unleveled from just traveling. Um, so we're going to go over a few of those steps. Um, so that would be all the four steps of print that we just covered. The only one that we'd have left would be that print from SD card. And so let's talk a little bit about what troubleshooting we can do on these printers. So these printers are very manual and they're very easy to work on. So pretty much all of the components you can see face to face. And if you need to move something or something is loose, you can usually figure out what to adjust it if you need to. So we're going to kind of look at where the motors, the limit switch, and the belts are, just to figure it out real quick. So if we rotate it to the side of the yellow, we can actually see right inside here is a limit switch, and this is basically the X stop. 
So it tells it when to stop moving in this direction. So the big bar that's going across is going to be your X axis. We have X motor right here. It should be labeled as such with a little sticker on it too. Okay, did you do something to make it swivel or are you just turning the whole device? I just turned it to the side. Okay. Yeah. So these are pretty easy to remove. So I don't have to apply much force in order to remove that. Just keep that in mind. So it is pretty easy to remove those. So, you know, even if a student comes by and accidentally clips the wire, it's probably gonna pull it out something like this. And then that is actually not going to work. So keep that in mind that the motors are pretty easy to unplug, but they're also easy to reinsert and adjust. So there's the X. If we rotate further towards the back, Excuse me. If we rotate further to the back, here we have the E or extruder motor. And we're using a Bowden extruder. So your others may have direct or drive. The Bowden extruder actually goes from this gear here in the back. Excuse me. Allergies are getting to me this morning. They move from the gear through the Bowden tube then to the hot end and that keeps us to where we don't actually grind into the filament if the heat does creep up. We have a very consistent flow and I like it a lot more than a direct drive personally. If we look directly below the E motor, we should see the Z motor and it's gonna be on this big spiral axis here. Plugged in as well. And then if you look just to the side of the Z motor, we should see both of our Y and Y motor right here. Finally, the Z motor is gonna be in the front of the printer. So if we were to rotate it to the front, so I went ahead and just lifted this up. You can the back spiral, but you may get grease on your hands just to let you know. And you can just rotate it up and it should move this axis all the way up. And then you can always disable the motors you can touch here in just a second. So here is the final Z limit switch, and this is its bottom stop, so it basically it's saying when to stop moving downwards. I know that we do have a lot of troubleshooting issues with this, that sometimes it can slip down and it can cause it to continuously push down into the build area to make sure that this Z axis is actually, or the Z limit switch is at a good position. Um, it is from start, so. All right. So next, that's kind of just our general mechanical inspection or step two is going to be leveling the build plane. So oftentimes we find that um, students are kind of confused about what's going on with it or otherwise, and we do have some difficulty leveling build plate, but this is a completely manual one. So there is no like computer aided process or anything like that. It's simply that we are going to adjust three knobs on the bottom. So if we look here, we're going to have one knob here on the inside. It's a little difficult to see at first, and it's easier if you pull the build plate all the way forward to reach it. And you're also going to have two here on the outside. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a piece of paper and we want to level the size of the nozzle to 200 microns away. So I'm gonna move my camera here and here is the hot end nozzle. And so seeing as this is the only piece that gets hot and this is a piece that we want to have 200 microns away, we need a piece of paper. So if you take a piece of paper and you fold it in half, you should be able to have 200 microns. We're going to basically adjust that until we feel that it's appropriate and then we can move on. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna move this X axis down so it doesn't take as long to home or go to zero, zero, zero. And then I'm gonna click on the button once, go to setup, and then go to auto home. And this is gonna to move to the very front corner of the build area or it's gonna be zero X, zero Y, and zero Z. So once it's at that auto home position, we're gonna to have to disable the motors because when you auto home, it does lock everything just for safety. So if you click on disable motors, then we should be able to move these both around. So here, what we're gonna do is 
we're going to align that small nozzle directly above this first inside spring. And so I'm going to push it here into the inside and move that back a little bit and then I'm check the position by looking at it from the side. I'm a little bit too far forward. Over. You can actually see right there. I like to manipulate my printer so that you guys can see it more. Um, usually if you're leveling the build area, you want to try and keep it on a flat surface. Here you can see the spring. Here the nozzle is above it. So what we're going to do is we're going to slide that piece of paper in between the two. And so if it's too tight and you can't get it under, kind of like mine is, you can push down on this build plate because it is on springs and it should flip underneath just like so. So now mine is super tight and it's going to be too close. So what I would want to do since it's buckling the paper is I want to go counterclockwise to pull it down. I'm sorry? What did you do to disable the motors? So if you click on setup again, you should see disable motors right below auto home. Okay. Okay. And you just say Yep, and it allows you to move everything you need. So this needs to come over here. So if we're thinking of it from top down, if we're looking down on it just like so. If we rotate it counterclockwise, it's going to move the build area down. If we go clockwise, it should move it back up. It's a little counterintuitive, but it is something you'll get used to just as you adjust it more. Need to be done. How often do you have to, to do this kind of stuff? So leveling the build area doesn't necessarily have to happen all that often. So this is a troubleshooting step in the form that if something does go wrong or that you guys find that it's not adhering to the build area, this is the step that you would go through. So you would go through leveling the building area in order to make sure that the next print that comes out will fit successfully on that platform. So you can do this maybe depending upon what you're utilizing it on and if it's changing positions or moving and you're kind of manipulating it like so or it's going to different places often, then you might have to level it more than you believed you would. Um, if you leave it in the same spot and it doesn't really move all that often, we've known it to work for like an entire month in the same position before somebody came across it and said, oh, this isn't quite what I want it, so they re-leveled the build area. Um, it, so it is a troubleshooting step, so if something goes wrong, usually you're going to re-level and see if it can fix it. Does that help a little bit, answer your question a little bit there? Uh, this this process can be a little tedious, but I know that, you know, the low spot and stuff, those are going to have more of like automatic leveling processes rather than this much more manual kind of form. Uh, we find that this manual form is easier for students to do, and it's also more, a little bit more intuitive to seeing how the printer actually does work. It actually kind of tells them what it's doing when it's leveling rather than just them clicking on buttons. So next, since it is buckling like so, I'm going to move counterclockwise to move it down. And if you guys want to do this with me, just to ensure that your printer's doing well, I'll do that pattern as well. So I'm going to move it this direction by putting my hand in here. So it's hard to reach. So I like to scoot it back out counterclockwise and check it again. And I'm going to check and see if I have a small amount of drag where it almost feels like the paper is vibrating. So we want a distance that isn't too much, but isn't too little. And we want to feel a certain drag on the piece of paper. So at this point, you might be able to hear it dragging across, but it's not super hard to pull in and out. It's still buckling a little bit when I hold it with two fingers, so I'm going to keep going down. Turn by quarter turns until I get to the desired distance. So there's a good amount of resistance and it's not buckling if I'm just holding with two fingers. And it's pretty happy there. So that's gonna give us our 200 micron gap at that area.
So you got any questions about that right now? No, we're sticking on that. Cool. down on the plane and I want to raise the, the lower left hand corner or the left hand corner of the plate. Uh, which knob do I turn? So clockwise it's gonna go up. So if you are thinking of it like looking down on it, yeah, it's going up and counterclockwise will move it down. So which knob? Which knob? There's three knobs. For this corner? Yeah. Yeah, that corner. Yeah, that corner. This corner, there should be one right inside here. You should see a spring above it. So if you see the spring structure, it's going to be right there. That is the knob that it does. You must have smaller hands than we do. Really I do. It's really hard to get up under there to that knob. So it, to, in order to get to that knob, if you slide the build plate all the way forward, it should be a lot easier to adjust it. It should be almost right here at the very top of the black. So we're gonna raise it up. So if you push it all the way forward, and then you can adjust that. So which way do I turn it? Yeah, you said counterclockwise goes up and counterclockwise goes down, is that what you said? You go clockwise to go up, counterclockwise goes down. So clock up, count down. And then we should have our little up right here. So I do have the build plate pushed all the way forward, so it should be a little bit easier for you to grab if you do that. And then of course you'll move it back to that same position and feel the resistance that you have in your paper. Okay. Hold on a second. Yeah, certainly. Okay, turn it so this is really the hardest one to get to. Do it first just to give you the first experience of it and then the other two just go so much easier. Yeah, this one's much more manual in that sense of it does make you do it all by yourself. So you can make it too close and you can make it too far away, but that can also change how your print looks on the bottom of it. And it could be that you want it to look like it's further away or you do want it to be closer and you want it to kind of have a better adherence to the plate. And that allows you to do that in this situation. So we know we've got the that bottom left hand corner done now. Do you have this corner done? Yeah, I can. What corner we just finished? Okay, so now we're going to move out to this corner here, and you can see that one a little bit easier. So I'm going to tilt mine up, and here's the knob for that one. That one's a lot easier to see, and I just like to line up the nozzle a little bit. So mine's looking like it's probably a little bit too close there. 
and I'm going to have to adjust it. So I'm going to check the paper real quick, and the paper is our leveling platform. I'm going to slide it underneath. So it's actually not quite close enough, so I'm going to go bring it up until I start to feel that resistance. And right about there, I feel a little bit too much of a bite. There we go. And so small turns usually are best. It's easiest to kind of adjust it so because sometimes you go a little bit over or a little bit too far. Yep, so once you're finished with that one, you can move back to this corner here. And this is going to be our last little point for our triangle. And so it's right about there. And so remember that we are leveling a triangle, so it's going to treat this back corner a little bit different. The left hand back corner is going to be a little bit different because if you adjust these two, it'll adjust basically how this height is. And by lowering or hiring this one, it'll adjust this side as well. So that you can take into account if you are leveling it. Usually this side ends up being pretty well once you have each of these at the same resistance level. This line is much too tight there, so I'm gonna go counterclockwise. And then it feels pretty level like so, and I like to check the rest of the bed once I have them all done to see if all of it feels just about right. So that might be a little bit too close. All right. So let me know when you feel comfortable with that, and then we'll move on to the very last topic troubleshooting these printers. So leveling the build area can happen pretty often, depending upon how long it takes it for it to get to that nice position the first time. Um, so it can vary depending upon the print, just maybe with student used it or otherwise, they may adjust it and it may be a little bit different in height. Um, so, but once you get it at that sweet spot, usually it's gonna be good for a while unless someone comes by and manipulates it or, you know, us in some way that causes the build plate to change. Once you feel comfortable with it, I'm sure it's pretty good. And what we're going to do now is we're actually going to kind of the filament issues. And first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to heat this up. Move this off of the build area. So if you heat the nozzle while it's so close like it is, it can actually leave small pot marks or burn marks in the area itself. So to the x-axis up. So in order to do that in a different way than we did prior, you can hit the button once and go to controls. Under the control option, you can be able to see move axis here at the bottom. If we scroll down to that and click on it once, and then we click move one millimeter. And then if we move Z, then we should be able to move this entire bar up. So click 
and then crank it up to about 20, 25 should be good. We just want to have it high enough so that when we push plastic into, it doesn't create a blob and it also doesn't burn into our building while it's up. Go to 20. Let's see. And then you can just click on the back arrow to go all the way back through. It also times out most of the time and it'll just go back to the status screen once it's been sitting for a little while. So now that we kind of have it moved up off of the build area, we click on the button and go to setup this time. And in setup, we're going to have two preheat values. So we have the first one. Hold on one second. Certainly. So how do I get back up to the main screen again? So if you click on the very top option of each screen, it should pull you back into the next one. If I'm in, say, move axis and move one millimeter. Yeah, okay, I'm back, I'm back to the main again. Okay. And then we're going to go to control or to setup this time. And then we're going to look at the two preheat values that we have. So we have preheat PLA and preheat soft pool. Okay. So what soft pool does is it heats the extruder nozzle to 100 degrees Celsius from a cool temperature. You have it at say about room temperature, about 24 degrees Celsius, and then heat it up by soft pool. It's going to heat up to its transition phase in between becoming from a liquid to a solid. And at that phase, you can pull it out to help remove clogs or remove old colors. And this is what we would recommend if you are swapping colors to set up and preheat soft pool, remove the color, and then preheat PLA to insert the new color. So soft pool is going to be a method for you to remove clogs or remove old colors from your printer, and we find that it is very helpful in that form. This is probably our biggest troubleshooting step for uh, fixing clogs is the soft pool. Go ahead and click on preheat PLA. So if it timed out, you can go back to setup and then preheat PLA. Status screen here at the very top, we're going to have a 220 degree right above, and then we're going to have a certain value underneath. So mine's about 33, 35 right now, and that's it heating up. It's trying to reach the value of 220 degrees Celsius. This is kind of your display to let you show that. And then you have your X, Y, Z bar across, and so when it's printing, it'll actually change those numbers. This bar that's kind of blank in the middle right now, right above the letters, the time remaining or how long it's been processed. Basically a completion bar. All right, so now that we have it heated up, we can go ahead and feed our filament through. So my filament is in the spool holder. If you guys need to know how the spool holder goes together, they basically just slot together and then you tighten these screws on the outside. So mine's at 160 degrees right now, so we could actually probably start feeding through the filament. So what I'm gonna do with the filament, in order to put it into this printer, is a little bit different. It's gonna be here on the back side. So if you look here towards the yellow panel, and we look here at the Z axis, we should be able to see a small hole here with this trigger. Here, and then where this trigger releases pressure from our gear in order to feed the filament through. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to go ahead and unspool the filament so that it's not locked in place anymore. And we have to cut it at a very hard angle so that it's easier to feed through. So if I cut it at an angle like so, it should leave me kind of a point with it and it makes it easier to push through the printer. Once I have that, then I'm going to go ahead and squeeze the trigger in the back. It's a little difficult, so I kind of like to grip the whole motor like so. Squeeze the trigger together and push that all the way through to the other side. And then it should go all the way through the Bowden tube. So it'll take a little while to go through the Bowden tube, but we'll push it all the way through. And then once you feel the resistance hit it, then what it is it's probably at the nozzle. And I want you to put a little bit extra so that we can extrude some plastic and so that we can get out those old colors. So this is another form of troubleshooting. Feed the new filament through. So I went ahead and pushed it all the way through. So it'll push out old colors and it also push out small clogs. Great way to kind of use the filament itself as a way to manipulate.
So if you notice on mine, there's kind of a little bit of plastic hanging underneath the nozzle, which I built up my pressure and it should be good. So I'm gonna go ahead and clip that off, that off either with some pliers or otherwise. But remember that nozzle is the hot piece and we don't wanna to touch it with our hands. So do we have any questions about kind of what that is and how to do that? Or do you feel comfortable with feeding filament? We're good. We're going okay, so all we have left to kind of talk about is there's another tool within your toolkit that you guys got. Be a small little needle. That small needle is used for flossing the nozzle. So heat it up like we have it now and have no filament in it. You can floss the nozzle in order to, yes, exactly that same piece. You can floss the nozzle in order to remove clogs. And that's basically if you have a very deep or hard clog, that is the way to remove it. You hook it back through and then perform a soft pull to pull it out the rest of the way. So that's kind of our filament issues and what we can go over. So one thing I do want to make you aware of is that right now, so I have it heated. We also have filament inside of it and it's not printing. So it's not extruding anything. This cause that filament to bake inside the nozzle because we're right around 500 degrees Fahrenheit or otherwise. We just leave it in the state that it is for like the next 10 minutes, we will create a carbon cloth. So that's something you want to avoid. Printers, their fail safe is simply unplugging them from the side. It'll stop the printer and anything it's doing, but it'll make you restart the print if you did have a print in it. Goes out, these don't have a fail safe to restart from the part that they were lost, but they will completely function and there's no problem on plugging them at any point. So, if it's screaming at you or it's making funny noises or it seems like one of the limit switches is off, so it still keeps trying to move that way, um, you can push this unplug and it should be safe. Okay. So, next, all we have to do is click print from SD. So, we kind of talked about all our troubleshooting. Now, we can click on the button once print from SD and select the test prints. Either of the keychain or the six-sided dice, you're welcome to use. The process it goes through after selecting the file is going to be heating, home, and then it'll start printing. So I'll stay with you until we see if the layers stick to the platform. So this blue lock build, have you guys had any experience with these? Oh yeah, Dremel has some included with them. Microporous surface that helps to grab kind of the plastic laying onto them. All right, is it successfully laying that first layer down? Awesome. We think so. Okay, sounds good, guys. Do you have any questions for me, or do you have any kind of concerns about the printer or otherwise? I'm sorry? Yeah. So we do have more of these blue uh, build tacks. Um, we actually have a 12 by 12 build tack. Uh, these builds actually are a micro porous surface that helps to actually adhere to the filament. So it is nice to have on printers. So if you do have like a lull spot, I know a lot of people use painter's tape and painter's tape does work. It just tends to wear out faster and sometimes it sticks less than build plates tend to. Um, so that may be something that nice to invest in or otherwise. Um, they, there are multiple different types of them available. We prefer ones by lock build. But you guys sell these? We do, we do sell these. They should be online at our website. You should be able to log on. These, the ones right here should be about 15, and then I think the larger ones are right around 25, 30. Okay. All right, well, awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear it. So if you guys have any concerns or anything like that, 
Um, I will send you the follow-up email highlighting a few things from our website and also this video, I will create a link to it. Um, if you guys need any support or help, just log on to our support page and su submit a ticket um, and we will respond to you as fast as possible. So we try and respond to you within a day and, try and get your issues sorted so that you can keep printing. Sounds good. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And Thank you.